Is the earth flat? No. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. What? I answered the question. Oh, you want me to give some reasons? Oh, okay. That's fine. I can do that. Okay, the flat earth has, uh, believe it or not, become a, a movement, a movement in the last few years. About 2015, it started up. And uh, people may wonder, well, Danny, why are you so concerned about this? Why are you talking about flat earth so much? Well, you see, our critics for a long time have been equating belief in creation with belief that the earth is flat. And so I view the flat earth movement as a personal assault, really, upon my calling and upon the ministry of Answers in Genesis. So I think it's very important, vitally important, that we're here to give people thoughtful, good reasons why the flat earth movement is wrong and to answer questions people may have about it. And we've been getting many inquiries about this over the last few years. Well, you may say, uh, didn't we answer this question, settle this question five centuries ago? I mean, after all, didn't Christopher Columbus prove that the earth is a globe? Well, actually, we didn't settle it five centuries ago. We settled it 20 five centuries ago. And in fact, I think that's part of the problem we have here is the fact that people's understanding of history on this whole matter is rather poor. Well, how do we know it goes back that far? Well, Pythagoras, you may have heard of him with the Pythagorean theorem and a few other things that he did. In the late, uh, late 6th century BC, he actually talked about the earth being a sphere. We don't know what his reasons were. We can only speculate about that. But uh, it went forward from there. But within 100 years, most uh, Greek thinkers were thinking the earth was a sphere. And I do credit uh, th this whole question as being a good epistemological study. I used to raise this question with my students in my astronomy classes when I taught at the university. I'd ask the, the students the question, what shape is the earth? And eventually somebody would say, oh, it's a globe, it's a sphere, it's a ball. And I'd say, okay, how do, how do you know that? And I very rarely found any students that could give me a good reason. Again, I think that's part of the problem as well. What do I mean by being a good epistemological study? Well, epistemology is defined by Merriam-Webster as a study or a theory of the nature and grounds of knowledge, especially with reference to its limits and validity. That's kind of a, a long-winded definition. Let me give you a much shorter definition. Epistemology is how we know what we know. And I'm afraid that much of our education is geared towards cramming into the heads of students as much information, facts and figures and dates, without really assimilating that into an understanding. And what I wanted to get across to my students at the university was not so much what to believe, but to understand why these things are true. That's the real education part, is getting people to understand the reasoning behind these things. And so we have some good reasons for believing the Earth is a globe. How do we know that? Well, here we have a photograph of a total lunar eclipse. I took this in January of last year, about 15 months ago now. And it was quite a last total solar eclipse, a lunar eclipse visible from here. And this is during totality. This is about a 12-second exposure because the moon was very dim. But I also took photographs during the partial phases before and after the eclipse. And here's one of those photographs right there. I show the moon moving in from the right upper right, in fact, and that's exactly how the moon moved in on the Earth's shadow. And you can already see the edge of the Earth's shadow there, and you can get an idea of the shape of the Earth's shadow. It's kind of a curved section there. Now, I took this about an hour before totality. I took another one afterwards, totality, and I put it in the same right position here, and I think you can understand now a little better what kind of shape the Earth's shadow is. If you're really not seeing it at all, I can help you out and put a circle in for you. Turns out the, um, the circle of the uh, Earth's shadow is about mm, two and a half times that of the circle of the moon. So the moon can be entirely engulfed inside of that shadow, giving us a total uh, lunar eclipse. Aristotle, in 350 BC, argued, wrote a book called On the Heavens, and he wrote that in his book that this is one of the arguments why we know the Earth is a sphere. He gave a couple others. Here's another one I like. Um, he looked at the altitude of stars in both the northern and southern parts of the sky. I have a photograph here of the Ark Encounter. Many of you will recognize exactly where that was taken, over near Mzara's Cafe, looking at the front there. Uh, this photograph was taken by a good friend of mine, Jim Bonser, from Iowa, a pastor there, a good friend of the ministry. And we had special permission a couple years ago. We went down there and spent about half a night shooting this, this photograph and a few others. And this is a half-hour exposure. You can see the stars are going in a big circular pattern. Near the center of that, just above the arc, you'll see one single star. That's Polaris, the North Star. 
And the uh, Polaris, or the North Star, is within a degree of this point in the sky we call the North Celestial Pole. To the eye, and even to this photograph, it's going to look like the North Star stays still and all the other stars spin around it. Now, less known is the fact that that angle that it makes with the northern horizon is equal to your latitude. So at the arc, it's around uh, 38, 39 degrees. So that's how high that the North Star is. And as I travel around the, around the country and around the world, I always make it a point to look at where the North Star is in the sky. If I can find it, some parts of the world you can't. Let me illustrate that for you. Let this green circle represent the Earth. And this vertical line will represent the rotation axis. The Earth spins around that, that rotation axis once a day. The North Pole will be at the top, and the South Pole will be at the bottom. Let this horizontal line represent the equator of the Earth. Actually, the equator is going to be a, going to be a circle going around this plane intersecting the Earth there. But from the side view, it's just going to look like a line. Now, let's place the observer at some uh, position, some latitude north of the equator. This is very close to what it would be for us here in northern Kentucky, around 39 degrees latitude. You can see it's a little less than half, so that's a very good representation of where we would be. Now, if you placed an observer at the end of that line, representing some temperate location such as ours, then the uh, horizon would be defined by the uh, tangent plane to the circle, the, assuming it is the sphere of the Earth at that point. It's going to be a tangent plane, and I'll represent that by a little dotted circle going around like that. So if you stand there uh, at that point, everything to the upper right of that circle, that plane represented by the circle, would be visible, and nothing to the lower left would be visible. It would be below the Earth's surface and blocked at that point. Now we can construct a, a little dome there to show what it looks like, and yes, the sky at night looks like a dome. It doesn't mean it is a dome, it looks like one. That's a bit of an illusion. That's why a planetarium works so well. We have a planetarium here uh, at the uh, Creation Museum, a new one, in fact. We've, we've changed everything in it, so when we reopen after the COVID-19 um, scare is over, then we can... Um, you can come visit our planetarium, hopefully. We'll have new shows eventually, but it's a beautiful planetarium. I can't wait to start using it. But uh, we can uh, do that because it has a dome, and it does a fairly good job of representing what the sky looks like. So yes, the sky looks like a dome, but it doesn't mean that it is a dome. Now, I can draw a line from my location parallel to the rotation axis, and that's going to point to the direction in the sky around which the entire sky will seem to spin the North Star will be located very close to that. So all the stars will spin around that point. Now, if I draw a line due north like that, there will be an angle. You can see that angle there between the uh, point to the north celestial direction and the north direction, and that angle is equal to your latitude. If you've studied geometry, you could take this diagram and you could work that out and prove that. It's a nice little geometry problem. So if you've got some homeschoolers here taking high school geometry, that might be a good assignment. If you know something about geometry, you should be able uh, to do that one. Now, what would happen? What would happen if I went farther north, say up, oh, up into Canada somewhere? Well, it's going to shift like that because my latitude is like that. I'll go back to Kentucky, now up to Canada back to Kentucky, up to Canada. See what's going on? I'm shifting position as I do that. Now notice something. Notice the angle that the, the, the North Celestial Pole or the North Star will make with the horizon for me in Kentucky. Look at it farther north. The angle's much higher, isn't it? It's much higher. Again, that angle is equal to your latitude, and you can show that if you do geometry. If you go back farther south, it's a little lower. Now notice that if I look to the lower right, I can see stars down near the southern horizon. But if I go farther north, the southern horizon rises up and there are stars that I cannot see down to the south. You know, a couple of years ago, I was in um, the U United Kingdom and I made a trip up to Scotland while I was there and went to Edinburgh. I had a wonderful time uh, while I was there, by the way. And it was a clear night, uh, one night in Edinburgh. So I went outside to look for the North Star and it was almost two-thirds the way up from the, from the horizon. And uh, back here in Kentucky, it's not even halfway up. You know, uh, a few months later, I was in South Florida visiting my sister, latitude on 27, 28 degrees, and maybe 27, 26 even. And the uh, North Star wasn't even a third of the way up. Again, all that I see when I travel is consistent with this. It easily explained in terms of a spherical Earth. In fact, it's required. It's, it's a proof, as it were, because if it weren't true, it would disprove 
the spherical model completely. Now, if you want more proof, this is uh, due to uh, Pliny the Elder in uh, the first century AD. He noticed, the first, we, the first person we know of who actually pointed this out, other people may have noticed it before, but that ships as they sail away disappear whole first. And I don't live near the ocean, so I can't test this very often, but I was at Virginia Beach a few years ago, and I uh, took the photographs of a departing uh, container ship. You can see the ship right here. It's got the uh, NKY uh, line on the side. That uh, that is a, excuse me, NYK line. That is a major uh, Japanese shipping firm. And you can see it's already blocked off. When I got to the beach that day and I set my telescope with the camera on it looking out over the water, this ship had already gone out some distance. And the bottom of the, um, the hull is totally blocked by something. It looks like the water to me. Now, why would it be blocked? By the way, those, those, those um, letters don't go to the water line. I've seen plenty of their ships close up and they stop before they get to the water line. So again, I know part of the hull is being blocked here. What's blocking the hole? Well, I believe it's the curvature of the earth. Now, flat earthers will try to claim you just zoom in that uh, you will be able to, uh, to bring it back in. Uh, folks, I've got a oh, nearly 1,400 millimeter focal length on the telescope that I use. That is a whale of a telephoto lens. Zooming in, I've already done it. The, the, the uh, bo bottom of the, of the hull is blocked. I took a number of pictures. Here's one a little later. You can tell the ship's farther out because, well, it appears smaller. These are printed at the same scale. You can see the white bri uh, bridge castle there, and it's much smaller on the second photograph than on the first photograph. And uh, you can't see the hull at all. You can see a little bit of a, of a, of a what we call an inferior mirage of some of the planking down by the deck there. In the later photograph, you don't even see that. The ship has turned now. All I can see is the stern, but I don't see any of the hull. I see just uh, containers, and some of those are actually being mirrored in that infer inferior mirage. And then finally, as we get late in the day, uh, you can't even see that. All you can see is the bridge castle part of it mirrored. Again, more and more and more of the ship is disappearing. Eventually, it would have disappeared entirely. Unfortunately, it was late afternoon. Light levels were dropping fast. The sun was getting ready to set, and I had to end what I was doing. Now, building on this, a man named Eratosthenes in the, around 200 BC accurately measured the size of the earth. When I'd point that out to my students, they were always very surprised. What do I mean? Over 2,000 years ago, they knew how large the earth was, not only just how big uh, it was a sphere, but how, what the circumference and the radius were. Yes, they knew that information. How did he do it? Well, Eratosthenes was Greek. He was living in Alexandria, a city of Greek learning uh, in, in north, uh, northern Egypt. Settled, uh, it was established by Alexander the Great 23, 2400 years ago. And he worked, uh, Eratosthenes worked at the great library that was there at uh, Alexandria. He traveled down to southern Egypt uh, one year around the summer solstice. He's near uh, this little town called Syene, which is today it would be called Aswan. And it's on the edge of the tropics. And on the, on the June solstice uh, at noon, the sun is directly overhead. He knew this because he looked down into a very deep well. And for a few moments around noon, he could see the entire bottom of the well. That's only possible in the tropics. At my latitude, if you have a deep well, you won't see anything. It'll be in shade because the sun's never directly overhead. Well, he went back home to uh, Alexandria and he waited a year. He, he uh, constructed a vertical pole. He knew it was vertical because they were very good builders. They could, they could design and build things very well there. And he also knew the height of this, of this thing. Again, they were good engineers and good architects. What he did is he waited till the next year on the same June solstice, and he looked at the uh, shadow of this, uh, of this pole on the, uh, at noon on the June solstice. Now, it's going to cast a shadow because that far north, you're out of the equatorial regions, out of the tropics, the sun's never going to be overhead. And he determined that that angle that it made, he used trigonometry to do this by knowing the height of the pole and the length of the shadow. He figured out this angle up here, and he expressed it as a fraction of a circle. It was about one-fiftieth of a circle. And he realized then that the distance between those two would be one-fiftieth of the circumference of the earth. Now, one thing I haven't told you is Eratosthenes is the father of geography. He coined the term, and he was really the world's first geographer. He uh, had a lot of surveys done, and they mapped out Egypt pretty well, and he knew the distance between those two. It was like 5,000 stadia, about 500 miles by our reckoning. So what he did is he multiplied that 5,000 stadia by, uh, by 50, 
and he got the circumference of the earth to be 250,000 stadia, or about 25,000 miles or 40,000 kilometers. Pretty impressive for 2,200 years ago. So if people knew in the ancient world that the earth was flat, I'm talking about it in the West, by the way. The Greeks knew this. They, they shared this information. The Romans knew it. And throughout the Middle Ages, people in the West knew that the earth was a sphere. This was not lost information. So how did this flat earth myth arise? This idea that everybody in, up until 500 years ago thought the earth was flat. Well, I would attribute it to two thing, three things that happened in the 19th century. Number one, archaeology as we know it came about. The uh, way you excavate things and the way you do the science was developed in the 19th century. And the uh, prime targets were Egypt and Mesopotamia. And as they excavated in Mesopotamia, they came across this, um, well, I'll put it in quotes, air quotes as well, cosmology of the ancient Near East. And this cosmology of the ancient Near East was this idea that the earth was a flat disk with a dome over top. Now, y'all... Y'all put this, my, oh, here it is. You put it up here behind the screen. Okay, I got a little visual aid for you here. I got a circle that uh, can represent their model. Here's this flat earth. So here's the earth, and there's a dome over top of the earth is what they were saying was the model they had there in ancient Mesopotamia. And this then became the ancient uh, Near East cosmology. Now, I put that in quotes and in air quotes because... So it turns out a few years later, they discovered that it wasn't the uh, cosmology of the ancient Near East. It was merely a cosmology of the ancient Near East. There were many, many others. And uh, it was very difficult to try to correct the record. It just sort of stood out there. Also, what happened coming out of liberal scholarship was what we call the documentary hypothesis that the, uh, Moses didn't write the, uh, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, especially Genesis. Uh, who knows? They didn't think Moses even existed. But if he did, the... Uh, the, uh, the Pentateuch was actually written about a thousand years or more after when Moses supposedly lived. This would have gone to the captivity or even after that. And since in captivity they were in Mesopotamia, they naturally picked up a lot of religious beliefs and cosmology and so forth from them, and they just simply incorporated those into the Bible. Now, folks who understand the authority and inspiration of Scripture should recognize very quickly this was a direct assault upon that. Now, this then developed, this is their diagram again. They said, this is what the cosmology of the ancient Near East is. And by the way, the cosmology of the Bible, you've got this round flat disk and you've got the dome over top. And they didn't really get that from Scripture at all. What they got it from was the assumption that the, the, the Pentateuch is not inspired at all, but rather was simply picked up from bits and pieces in Mesopotamia. And then people began to choose to read Genesis and other passages in that manner. Also during the 19th century we have what's called the conflict thesis and the conflict thesis was this that there's always this conflict of between Christianity and religion but they meant Christianity really and progress going on throughout the middle ages and it was only in, when they threw all that off in the age of reason and the enlightenment that supposedly uh, things got better uh, in the west and around the world. And of course, this fit very nicely with the narrative. It was that point when uh, critics and skeptics began to argue, well, the Bible is a flat earth book. And unfortunately, some, um, some Christians at the time picked that up as truth and wore it as a badge of honor. That is where the flat earth movement began. Now, though, I will mention in passing that even earlier in the 19th century, Washington Irving, who's an author I really like quite a bit, um, he, in 1828, uh, wrote a history of the life and voyages of Christopher Columbus. It was a multi-volume set, went through many, many volume editions throughout the 19th century, read quite a bit, and uh, he supposedly researched it in Spain and so forth, but it meant much of our mythology about uh, Columbus came from Washington Irving's supposed biography. Uh, he had a way of blending fact and fiction in a way that we understand a little better today. But 200 years ago, people, when they read bio biography, didn't even conceive of the idea that there might be some fictional things thrown in, which he did a lot of that. For instance, the, the idea that his, his, uh, his uh, crew was about to, to mutiny because they thought they were going to fall off the edge of the world, that's nonsense. They were a bit concerned about being so far from land. They'd been f uh, going out for a couple of months and at uh, that time, you never sailed more than three days out of sight of land. Pretty scary thing out there. Oh, I've got a photograph here of a, uh, of a, of a drawing, a depiction 
of um, the, uh, the creation of day two, you have there on the left Jesus the Creator, of course, according to um, Apostle John in the New Testament. And you have there the uh, earth, and it's surrounded by this expanse, this rakia, from whom the King James says, around the earth with waters above. That's very clearly day two creation. And I want you to look at the shape of the earth. Do you get the impression that it is flat? No, you get this distinct impression it is a globe, it's a ball, it's a sphere. Now, where did this depiction come from? It comes from a Bible that belonged to King John the Good of France. Now, we know how old this Bible is because I think it was in year 16, uh, 1356, uh, he was de defeated by the English in the Battle of Poitiers, and this was taken by the English as part of the prize and spoils of war, and it's been in continual possession of the English ever since. And we think the Bible was actually put together around 1350. And this is 150 years or so before Columbus's voyage. So again, by 1350, people clearly were believing the earth was a globe. Common knowledge, actually, in the West. Now, I mentioned about the flat earth being born, and a very pivotal man in this was Samuel Rowbottom. He was a 19th century Englishman. He uh, wrote some books, did a lot of lecturing and speaking. Uh, he made a lot of what he called the Bedford Level Experiment. The Bedford Level is this region in eastern, uh, place in eastern uh, England where the land appears to be very flat. There's a very, there's a canal basically that's been dug that's very straight and the, the, with no real tilt. There's not much of a current at all. And uh, they've got this long thing that goes on for six miles that's reasonably flat. And what he did is he got down into the, uh, the water uh, there at point uh, A on the right in the diagram, eight inches above the uh, surface of the water. That's key because if the earth is a globe 25,000 miles around, then if you're eight inches above the water, in one mile's distance, your view will be blocked by that edge of the earth. Anything beyond that sitting right on the water theoretically will not be visible. So what he did is he had somebody get in a boat, a rowboat, and he rowed away from him the entire six miles. First mile, of course, he's in view. But beyond that, he reasoned, being eight inches above the water with his telescope, the bottom of that boat should start to disappear, and the boat should continue on disappearing and disappearing. It had a, you can see a flag or a marker sitting up there about six feet up in the boat. And by the time you get the entire six miles away, uh, the boat should be, um, should be hidden by a good 10 or 12, 15 feet of curvature. Well, Rowbottom was able to see that boat the entire length. He said, aha, if the curvature would block out my view of the boat over, over six miles, and yet I'm still seeing the boat, then the earth must be flat. You see this little... Uh, this little red line I'm showing you here uh, draws from the boat back towards the observer, but because of the curvature of the earth, it's greatly exaggerated here, of course. It uh, ex exits out into space, moving off on a tangent, so it's not visible. Now, I put down there that the problem is he ignored atmospheric refraction caused by temperature inversions. I don't have time to talk about the physics of all of this, but the speed of light depends critically upon, in, in air at least, depends critically upon the temperature of the air. In warmer air, the light travels more quickly. In colder air, it travels more slowly. As it turns out, bodies of water stay relatively cool during the summertime because water has a large uh, specific heat. In the winter, it generally stays warmer. That's why uh, if you have a location near a very large body of water, the temperature is moderated tremendously. The Gulf Stream, for instance, moderates the temperature in the British Isles and parts of Northern Europe. Now, if you do this in the summer or in spring on a warm day, the air temperature is almost always going to be warmer than the water temperature. The water temperature will chill the air close to it, so you end up with a layer of very cold air, and the air light moves more slowly in that. As it starts to move on that tangent, leaving the cooler air into the warmer air, it cannot do that. It's going to be refracted or bent downward, and it's going to curve along the edge of the earth. There's a perfectly reasonable and logical and physical explanation as to why people sometimes get these results, as Roadbottom did 150 years ago, 180 years ago now, there on the Bedford level. Now, there are modern examples. One of the examples that flat earthers like to talk about is this particular photograph, and ones like them. It was done by Joshua Nowicki. I want to emphasize that Joshua Nowicki is not, repeat, not a flat earther. Flat earthers love his work, and I'm sure he's frustrated to learn that. Well, what did uh, Mr. Nowicki do? He's a very good photographer, by the way. I'm impressed with his work. He goes out to Grand Mirror State Park 
and other locations in southern Michigan, on Lake Michigan, but on the state of Michigan. And Chicago is more than 50 miles across the lake. Now, sometimes it gets some elevation to do this, but other times it's closer to the water. The point is, no matter how high it gets over there, there are no high hills over there, you shouldn't be able to see Chicago because the Earth's curvature would amount to nearly 2,000 feet of curvature and nothing on the skyline of Chicago is that tall. So there it is. Again, why, if this is such evidence that the Earth is flat, even better than the um, Bedford Level experiment that Robottom did, how is Joshua, Joshua Nowicki not a flat earther? Well, again, I said he's a good photographer. He knows his craft. He knows what he's doing. He goes out here on very clear days when there's a temperature inversion, precisely the conditions he knows that on a spherical earth you're going to be able to get these impossible photographs. You see, if he shoots across there during a time of no temperature inversion and he doesn't see Chicago, that is not a very interesting photograph, is it? But this one is. This is a fascinating photograph, and he's done this a number of times. In fact, he's done the, some of these. I've seen on uh, some of his videos online. He puts them in a time-lapse video, and what you find is that the skyline bobs up and down like this. You see more and less like this as it bobs up and down. Now, if this is evidence that the Earth is flat, what does that mean? Well, it must mean that Chicago is bobbing up and down, but nobody in Chicago seems to notice that. The reason why it bobs up and down is because the amount of refraction that's going on over those 50 miles varies tremendously with gusts of wind and shifting air masses. And so consequently, it's not surprising it's going to bounce up and down. In fact, it's what we would expect. Again, contrast this with my earlier photos. I went on a day that it was, um, there was no temperature inversion. It was in early November. The air temperature was 50 degrees when I started. It dropped to 49 before I finished. The water temperature, I looked it up, was 62 degrees. It was 12 degrees warmer than the air temperature was. There was no temperature inversion, so I knew that I would not um, be able to get a photograph like this. I would get the thing you're supposed to see. See, the problem is flat earthers don't like to do these problems, uh, these, these experiments, in the middle of winter over, over, uh, with cold air temperature and warm water. They much prefer to do it in spring and summer, but that's precisely the conditions that are going to be prevalent to cause these temperature inversions and refraction. So Robottoms begins with this experiment, and the flat earth movement was born. Throughout the 19th century, he was teaching this on up until his death uh, late in the century. And the uh, movement kind of peaked around 1890 or so, and it even continued into the 20th century, but it began to wane considerably in the 20th century. By the time you get to the 1930s or 50, 1950s, hardly anybody's believing it. And uh, since then, since the 50s, there have been several flat earth societies that have started up. And some of those have been kind of tongue in cheek, others more or less serious, but it's, it's, a, it's a grab bag. There have been various flat earth societies. And the flat earth movement was revived in the 21st century, about five years ago, around 2015. And it's really been uh, fueled by social media and YouTube. Uh, that, that's, that's a platform that uh, anybody can put anything they want up there. And I, I think that many of these flat earth sites are really not genuine at all. These are people who are wanting to, uh, uh, to just have fun at people's expense and see how many people they can snooker by some remarkably bad arguments many times. And I found with my study over the past four years plus of the Flat Earth Movement, there's a broad range of theological beliefs. There are very conservative Christians. There are New Agers. There are Muslims. There are many different beliefs. The Flat Earthers are fond of saying there aren't any atheists among the, the, uh, the Flat Earthers. I guess the idea is, is that this is a, a flat Earth, round Earth with a dome over top, is a very contrived sort of cosmology. So why would, uh, uh, how could you possibly not believe there's a creator of some sort? The problem is it doesn't naturally then lead to a belief in the God of the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a very important point because, again, broad range of theological ideas. I'm most concerned with the Christian version of this, however, and so uh, I would like to talk a little bit about some of the supposed biblical arguments for a flat earth. I don't have time to do all of them. Uh, I have discussed many of them in other places, and I will give you more references for that later on. But uh, I can't talk about all of them. I will talk about the rachia. That's a Hebrew word. This is something that God made on day two. Its purpose was to separate the waters above from the waters below. People have debated exactly what those waters above are. We'll continue to debate that. But this appears to be the cosmology of the Bible, if you will. Now, on day four, two days hence, 
the, uh, from the day two creation, God put the luminaries or the lights in the sky. He said he made the greater light and lesser light. He made the stars also. And I think that's referring to basically all astronomical bodies. There's a reason why I would say that. Many flat earthers today want to use the word star in the modern context and enforce it back on uh, what most people throughout time thought stars were. For instance, the planets were stars, as it turns out. Today, we still sometimes refer to them as, say, the evening star or the morning star. I've taken some photographs and put photographs up of of some planets recently, and I refer to them as stars. Why? Because that's what they look like in the sky. I've had people recently ask me about this very bright star in the evening sky. It's Venus, folks. It looks like a star, and I have no trouble calling it that because that's what it looks like. Now, um, in the early translations of the Bible into, uh, into English, they translated this word rakia into firmament. However, many more modern translations translate it as expanse, and there's a very good reason why they do that. Because that's probably the best meaning for the word. I happen to know several world-class Hebraists, people who really not only know Hebrew, but they know probably uh, 18 to 24 other ancient related Semitic languages. And by knowing the full range and all those other languages helps you to understand what the Hebrew means. And they say uh, unanimously that it means expanse. It doesn't mean this hard thing up in the sky, despite what many flat earthers try to claim. Now, they also argue flat earthers say, well, the earth was made before the sun. Uh, how, how can that be? Well, we've always believed that the earth was made before the sun, several days before the sun. That's not a problem, all right? It doesn't, doesn't automatically mean that the earth is a globe or it means it's flat. It just means that the earth was made before the sun. No problem at all. I don't, I, I don't understand what the point about that one is. They're saying, well, God, if he, if he made the earth first, it can't be a sphere orbiting the sun. Well, why can't he? He is God. He can do what he wishes. Now, ultimately, you have to ask the question, if the Bible teaches the earth is flat, then shouldn't there somewhere be in the Bible some sort of verse that says something like the earth is flat? But there is no such verse. There is no such verse that says that. Now, what flat earthers do is they take a number of passages, number of verses, and they choose to read them in a manner that's consistent with a flat earth. And then they say, aha, this is the meaning of what the scriptures say. And I'm saying, well, no, you're going to be hard pressed to find any Bible scholars, any Hebraists, anybody who's going to agree with you on that. Sometimes they'll say, well, those are just man's ideas. Yes, but you are a man too. So why should I believe you when you know very little about these things? And these other people know far, far more than you do. It doesn't really work. The, The complaint that they're merely men works both ways, you see, but somehow flat earthers don't seem to realize that. Again, there's nothing in Scripture that demands that the earth is flat. Merely people want to interpret it that way, and that is an example of eisegesis, reading into Scripture what you want to believe. Now, one of the arguments is that uh, you've got to read the Bible literally. In fact, people accuse us all the time. You at Answers in Genesis, you creationists, you believe everything in the Bible is literal. Well, actually, we don't. (laughs) That's a common misconception. For instance, we believe, we know, actually, that there are many figures of speech in the Bible. We have figures of speech in English. For instance, if you wanted to translate the the, the figure of speech, you're pulling my leg, in another language, it wouldn't make a lot of sense, would it? There are many other things like that. Then there are idioms as well, and idioms can be tricky as well, related to figures of speech. Then there are similes. Similes are things that you say when you use the word like or as. For instance, Jesus told a lot of similes. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a sower going forth to sow seed. Or the kingdom of heaven is like a um, pearl of great price. Or a treasure hidden in the field. He used the word is like this. This is a simile. He's not saying it is this. He's saying it's like this. But then there are metaphors. And again, there are many metaphors in Scripture. The Lord Jesus Christ in his ministry used many metaphors. He once said he was the door. He said he was the bread of life. He said he was the living water. You know, the night of the Last Supper, he told his disciples that he was the vine and they were the branches. And then he started talking about taking out something to prune them with. You know, all these cases, I don't think any of the listeners, at least the disciples following him, uh, thought he was literally saying these things. The woman at the well, she thought Jesus was talking about literal water. And he wasn't, of course, it's very clear, but she didn't get it. But the disciples, I'm pretty certain that night, didn't think that they were literally were, were branches on, on the literal vine that he had there. And when you come to the poetic and prophetic books, and the flat earthers rely heavily upon these, 
you find huge amounts of symbol, symbolism and allegorical themes coming into play. The book of Revelation, to me, is, is difficult to understand. I don't claim to understand it, but I, I am fascinated with it, as is most people. And uh, I find numbers all over the place. The number seven keeps popping up. In the first chapter, you've got the seven lampstands, you've got the seven stars. And fortunately for us, that's explained to us. But as you get past that, you have the seven bowls and the seven trumpets and the seven seals. And then you've got four showing up a number of times and 24 showing up each time and three a few times. And what do those numbers mean? Well, I don't know. I think there's some poetry involved in that. Numbers can be poetic, as we see. But there are many, many other forms of symbolism and allegorical themes showing up in the prophetic and poetic books. Now, I do note that many of these non-literal uses are absent from historical narrative. The book of Genesis has some idioms and figures of speech but the other devices there are largely missing. You see, the fear that some people have is, okay, if you start admitting that anything in the Bible is non-literal, then the, the door is wide open for reinterpreting the days of creation and the flood and so forth in some other way that doesn't mean what it says that it means. Well, that's nonsense. You see, you're confusing the two genres it's very easy to identify the poetic and prophetic passages in Scripture. There are certain factors that they have in them. We, we group them together in the poetic, the five poetic books, and the 17 prophetic books in the Old Testament. Now, the nar historical narratives, the first 17 books, are very different. They do have some non-literal uses, but they're not prevalent at all. That's how we can be certain when it's talking about a straightforward thing. It's not using symbolism or allegory. You, ne you need not to be lazy in these things. You need not to be fearful. You need to rightly divide the word of truth. Now, one verse the flat earthers love is Isaiah 42, 40, 22. That's one of their favorite ones. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. They say, aha, circle. A circle is two-dimensional. It's a flat plane. It is a round thing, uh, equal distant points from a center in a plane. Therefore, a circle, this means the earth must be a circle. Aha, the earth is flat and round as you can see here. Well, if you want to take that definition of the word circle, your particular peculiar definition of it, and you want to impose it upon ancient Hebrew, well, that's fine. But again, that is eisegesis. What does the Hebrew word there refer to? Well, it refers to something round. Now, is a circle a two-dimensional thing? Is it round? The answer is yes. Is a sphere, a globe, a ball, is it round? And the answer is yes. So both are round. And the word here is a bit ambiguous. It can refer to something that is a two-dimensional circle. It can refer to something that is a ball. They try to argue, the flat earthers do, that it means only a circle and not anything else. And that simply is false. Now, I know many Christian uh, scientists in the past that I've talked to, creation scientists, they have been fond of quoting Isaiah 40, 22 and say, aha, this word here is best rendered as being a ball or a globe. So therefore, uh, this is Isaiah 200 years, by the way, before Pythagoras saying that the earth is a globe. Is that true? And I don't think it necessarily is. Again, I know some world-class Hebraists and I've talked to them about this and they tell me, that the word is a bit ambiguous. It could mean a two-dimensional circle like this, but it also could mean a ball. We simply don't know for sure. So to our, hang your cosmology on this one verse is a real dangerous thing to do, but hang it, they will. They uh, have the globe here. You can see it's flat and round with Isaiah 40, 22 inscribed there. And you can see what their model is. At the center of this round disk is uh, the North Pole. There is no South Pole because you can't get there from here. And the continents are arrayed as much as you would by looking down from the North Pole of the Earth. And it's surrounded on the edges by this ice wall they call Antarctica. Antarctica, you see, is not a continent. It's simply an impenetrable wall of ice. And somewhere beyond that, the dome comes down and rests on that thing. Okay. Some flat earthers, and I can't believe they go here, they ask, they, they point out the earth having four corners. Well, does it have four corners? Well, let's look at it. Isaiah eleven twelve. It says, He will raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. 
Or how about this, Revelation 7, 1. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth so that, so that no wind might blow on the earth or against any tree. Again, the earth, Scripture says, has four corners. There are no corners on a globe. So therefore, the earth is not a globe. It must be flat. Case dismissed, slam dunk, we're done. As I said, I can't believe some flat earthers actually make that argument. Which is it? Is the earth round or is it square? Well, at least one flat earther in the 1890s, Orlando Ferguson, kind of split the difference. He had what I call here the roulette wheel model of the earth. It's square with angels in the corners, but then there's a round portion in there, and it's kind of, I call it the roulette wheel because it's kind of high in the middle and kind of dimpled like this, like a roulette wheel is sort of shaped. That was his model, and some flat earthers today at least half-heartedly talk about this one. I think most flat earthers, however, realize that the four corners talked about twice there in scriptures, once in the old, once in the new, are references to the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. Even today, we talk about whether the wind, for instance, coming out of the west, southwest, well, you're relating it to four cardinal directions. That's the way most of us understand this. Okay, what about the ends of the earth? There are 28 times the phrase ends of the earth appears in the Old Testament. For instance, Psalm 67, 7, it says, God shall bless us, let all the ends of the earth fear him. They say, aha, if you go to a globe, you go around and around and around that globe, you will never reach the end of that globe. So this cannot be talking about a globe earth. But if the earth is round and flat like this, there definitely is an edge. We call it the ice wall of Antarctica. Slam dunk, the earth is flat. Well, hold on a minute. Let's look at this just a little bit. I've got it underlined there. There's a parallel passage here. It says, God shall bless us and then let all the ends of the earth fear him. Now, I ask you, if you're talking, if it's talking here about the ends of the earth being a physical edge, then you're talking about geography. Can geography fear God? No, it's not talking about geography. It's talking about people. It's talking about the people living at the remotest parts of the earth. Let them fear him because of the awesome God we have. Isaiah 45, 22, another one. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, I, for I am God and there is no other. Again, real estate cannot be saved. Real estate cannot be saved. Only people can be saved. It's talking about people living at the remotest parts of the earth. Even today we use this idiom even though very few people believe the earth is flat. On a globe, we still talk about the ends of the earth because it's talking about those remotest parts of the earth. Here's another one I can't believe some flat earthers use. The tree of Daniel 4, they read Daniel 4.11. It says, the tree grew up and became strong and its top reached to heaven and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. They say, aha, on a globe. If you have a giant tree grow up, no matter how tall it gets, Half of the earth can't see it. It's on the other side of the earth. But if the earth is round and flat like this, then you can have a tree anywhere on the earth and people can see this tree. Well, let's dig into this. This is not a standalone verse in chapter 4. It's actually part of an entire narrative and nicely encapsulated. The entire fourth chapter is a complete narrative of an event that happened to Daniel there in Babylon. And uh, we can look at this. It says, the previous verse says this, "...the visions of my head as I lay in bed were these." I saw and behold a tree, a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. This was Nebuchadnezzar talking, the king, and he was having <coughs> a dream. A dream. Several points I want to make. It was a dream. I, I have several verses listed there. Verses 4 and 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 18, and 19. That many times it says it was a dream. It was a dream. It was a dream. I think we can be pretty certain it was a dream. I don't know about you, but my dreams are pretty surrealistic. I have dreams from time to time. I remember, don't remember most of them. But when I do, I wake up in the morning, I thought, wow, that was weird. I'll tell you one I had many years ago. There was this big wall over here, and suddenly this giant rhinoceros came crashing through the wall and, and charging toward me. By the time the, the rhinoceros got to me, it was a dove flying around. It was my, excuse me, it was a mother. My mother came towards me. And then when my mother got to me, she turned into a dove and flew off. That's typical of my dreams. So if someone wants to dream about a giant tree growing on the earth, that's actually more sane than the stuff I dream many times. Dreams are not real, folks. It's not reflecting the reality of the world. 
Also, I need to point out that this was a dream reported by a pagan king at that time. Also, Daniel interprets the dream, and he says the tree represented Nebuchadnezzar. Now, get this straight. It's a dream, so it's not a real tree, but within the interpretation of the dream, that non-real tree represents a person. You see the several levels removed from reality this is? It actually happened, but it's a representation. There's a lot of symbolism going on here, and it's being laid out beautifully by what Daniel's saying here. That's the factual part of all of this. The dream was real, and the interpretation was real. And by the way, the, the, the other factual part was the dream was fulfilled the seven years that he lost his mind. It's a dream, folks. The passage is not teaching cosmology. Furthermore, it's not even clear at all that the, the dream with possible cosmology there even matched what he Nebuchadnezzar believed. If I dream tonight that the earth is flat, it wouldn't mean that I believe the earth is flat. It just means I was thinking about it and I had some sort of weird dream associated with it. Well, what the current flat earth model, this is a diagram that I've seen on many of their websites. Again, you've got that uh, circle disc there with a dome over top and you've got the stars there. And what happens every day is that the stars, the whole sky spins around you got this axis right here above the North Pole, and the whole thing spins around. Now, right away, you'll realize that if it's all spinning around, then nothing is rising or setting. They're just going around. And if the sun is up there, then why do we, don't we have daylight all the time? In fact, how can flat earthers explain day and night? Well, it's very simple, they, explain, they say. Uh, you have the little dotted circle there representing the motion of the sun throughout the day. And the sun is a spotlight that shines down a conical shape of light like this. And so when we're under that cone, we see daylight and we're not, it's dark. So this is a little, little, uh, little uh, video that shows, uh, illustrates this nicely. This came from, again, from a Flat Earth website. The little white thing over in the dark, that's the moon. The bright thing in the light, that yellow thing, that is the sun. As it goes around, it goes around. And notice it's going to be night for me, then day, and then night and then day, because I live in North America, and then night. And notice as it does that, the sun gets progressively closer and farther from my location. For like right here, it will be very close. Here it will be far away. Here it will be close, and there it will be far away. So throughout the day, and throughout the night for that matter, the sun's getting progressively closer and farther away from me. Now this allows us to test this. I can simply apply mathematics to this. I can use geometry and trigonometry to work this out because if the sun's closer to me, it's going to appear larger to me. If it's farther away, it's going to appear smaller. That's pretty clear stuff. That's what we call perspective, folks. Flat earthers like to use that term. I hope they understand at least a little what that means. More distant objects look smaller to us. So I tested this claim. Uh, it, I took the model many of them have, not all of them. It's 32 miles across and 3,000 miles high. Now, again, the sun does not actually rise or set. And they say it's, a, it's motion like that. It's apparent disappearance is due to what they call perspective. Now, I, I worked out the requirements of this. And I use this model, but as it turns out, it factors out. It doesn't matter how high the sun is or how far away it is uh, it, and how big it is. All that matters is it's uh, moving in a circle above a flat earth, and it scales out beautifully. So if I have the sun only half that high and, twice, and half as big as I assumed in the model, it doesn't make any difference. It factors out, and I get the same result. It's an inevitable result of mathematics which describes the worlds around us. I tested this uh, be three and a half years ago. I did August 3rd, 2016. I took a photograph of the sun at 7.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time when the sun was 8 degrees above the horizon. Why did I do it then? I did it out back by the observatory here at the Creation Museum, and that was the first time the sun got above the trees. We have some trees off to the east, and I couldn't see the sun prior to that. And then I did, took another photograph of the sun at 1.45 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. That was local noon that day when the sun was as high in the sky as possible, 63 degrees. And if you go out on, at noon or at sunrise or sunset, you can tell the sun's much higher here at, sun, at noon than it is at sunrise or at sunset. And hence, it must, if the flat earth model's true, it must be farther away at sunset or sunrise than it is at noon. And so I did the numbers on this. I determined from the fat figures I had, again, distance doesn't really matter, that the sun ought to appear 6.4 times larger in the second photograph. So let's look at the photographs. Here's the first one. I took it in the morning. The sun's kind of dull and red. Uh, by, and you can see a little tree branch to the lower right there around the five o'clock position. Again, it's just getting above the trees. I set the... Um, ISO setting on this, I set the exposure time. I had a filter on the front of the telescope. The sun is very dangerous to look at if you don't have the proper filtering. 
And so I did the proper filtering. I changed nothing later in the same day, except that the uh, sun's higher in the sky. The ISO, the setting, everything else was the same. And here's the photograph of it. It's much brighter and more yellow. I ask you, look at those two diagrams, those two figures. Are they the same size or not? And the answer is they are. I've printed them out on paper and measured them, and they're the same size. No, forget 6.4. This in itself disproves the flat Earth model. Other examples of false claims. They say that the North Star is visible well into the Southern Hemisphere. I've been to the Southern Hemisphere 10 times, looked for the North Star. It isn't there. Uh, another one is the circular patterns of stars throughout the night can happen only on a flat Earth. I've seen both of these claims made repeatedly by flat Earthers on the Internet, and both are completely wrong and false. I'll give you an example here. Here's the model again. Let's suppose you've got a position. I happen to choose Australia here. Um, but uh, you can pick anywhere you want, not off, the rot uh, not off the rotation axis of the Earth. That dotted line represents that rotation axis. So supposedly the whole thing spins around, and so a person there in Australia would see, or any other location on the Earth, would see the North Star in the same position all the time. So far, so good. Now, that's the prediction of the flat Earth model. Everybody on the Earth should see the same stars, particularly they should all see the North Star. And indeed, some flat Earthers claim that that that's what happens. Now, on a spherical Earth, that's not the case. Here's the Earth again, as I showed you before. There is the rotation axis of the Earth. Early on, I showed what the position would be from a northern location, like here in northern Kentucky. I'm now going to show a southern location, south of the equator. I'm going to draw in the horizon circle, and I'm going to draw in the sky, the dome that you would see there. Now, notice that the north celestial pole, the north star, are located on the top of that diagram along that dotted line. That's the axis of the Earth, the North Pole, South Pole is below. Notice that you cannot see that from the Southern Hemisphere. That is a prediction of the flat Earth model. As, I mean, assume the other spherical Earth model. As I said, I've made 10 trips to the Southern Hemisphere. I have looked for the North Star. It is not there. I know the sky very well. I know what stars are around the North Star, and none of those were really visible. I could tell very easily, looking all night, the North Star is never going to be visible much south of the equator. When flat earthers claim that you can see the North Star south of the equator, they are wrong. They're either lying or they're misled themselves. I don't know which, but they are wrong. Flat Earthers stopped making that claim because it's blatantly false, as anybody who's in the Southern Hemisphere can testify is the case. Now, as far as the rotation of the stars, if, if you're going to position yourself on the Earth, I can put a star there on that little circle. It goes from stars on the left to stars on the right. So if the dome is spinning around like this, then stars are going to go in a circle. Now, if you are on the axis of that circle, that is along that red line that passes down to the north pole of the Earth, then the path of the stars will look like this. It will look like a circle. But what happens if you get off that axis, say over to where I live in the United States or maybe South America or Australia? You're going to be viewing that circle obliquely like this. And when you view a circle obliquely like this, what shape do you have? You don't get a circle anymore. You get an ellipse. And the farther off you get, the more elliptical it looks. Only on the North Pole, at the North Pole on the Earth, would you see stars going in circles around the skies. You would not see them Ordinarily, you'd see them all doing this if the Earth is flat with a spinning dome over top. I simulated this in our planetarium. I went in and took a photograph. I, I set the stars spinning around a point at the zenith, the point overhead. I set the camera off to the side, representing a position not at the, the uh, north pole of the Earth in this model. And you can see what I got. I got these ellipses, flattened out circles. This is what the sky looks like on a flat Earth, if this model's correct. But this is what you see. I took this photograph myself. It looks very much like the one uh, Jim Bonser took, the same sort of thing. The, uh, you're only seeing a half hour exposure, but if you went completely through 24 hours, it'd be complete circles. There are no ellipses showing up here. I've done videos of this. This is above the, uh, my house. You can see the North Star above the uh, point of my house there. You can see the Big Dipper, the upper left. This is about an hour time lapse I took, and you can see the things are spinning uh, counterclockwise around the... Um, the North Star there, a very close point to the North Star, showing what you see in the Northern Hemisphere. I took this one in uh, Arizona uh, last year, 
on a raft trip, and you can see the star, look to the south here, and you can see the stars are spinning in a clockwise direction, because I'm turned around, I'm looking to the south, I'm not looking to the north, and the center of motion is down below the screen. I can't see it because it's below the horizon. I'll show you again here, I've got the south celestial pole put in there for you, but everything else has been moved up tremendously, and if you look there, you can see that the motion is actually going around that circle, a point, that point, a point well below the horizon for us in the northern hemisphere. But guess what? If you go to the southern hemisphere, uh, like I have here, I took these photographs, this time lapse, uh, a year and a half, be last year in South Africa, and you'll notice that the stars now are going to go clockwise, and they're going around a point above the, above the trees there in the middle. There's no south star, there's no bright star there, but they're going clockwise in a circle around that. Now, folks, we can't see any of those stars in that photograph from where I live. In South Africa, there are a bunch of stars they can't see that we see in the northern part of the hemisphere. This is all demanded by a spherical Earth that's spinning, but not explainable at all in terms of a flat Earth model. So that model does not work. How do flat Earthers explain lunar eclipses? Well, they try to point out that lunar eclipses have been seen with both the sun and the moon in the sky. And that actually happens occasionally. It's called a selenelion. They try to uh, uh, impugn that, that this isn't possible. Well, it is possible because refraction can raise, if the sun and the moon are low in the sky, can raise them up about a half degree. But beyond that, uh, that's atmospheric refraction. But the sun and the moon and the earth uh, shadow are not points. They actually have a physical extent. Every lunar eclipse, there's a region on one side of the earth, a real thin strip, where the beginning of the eclipse is observable at sunset, and on the other side, where the end of the eclipse is observable at sunrise. It happens at every eclipse that this happens, lunar eclipse. Uh, you need excellent weather, and you need a good, no obstructions and a good clear view of the horizon in both directions. That's asking a lot. I've never seen a selenelion. I'd love to see one, but I've just never had the opportunity. I've seen plenty of lunar eclipses, however. Now, notice, however, in all of this that flat earthers don't offer any positive explanation. They just simply try to chuck rocks at the conventional cosmology. Well, that's fine. You're wrong, but that's fine. Come up with your own explanation for lunar eclipses. They, um, what about solar eclipses? Well, they don't explain those either. They say something comes in front of the, of, the, of the sun, but they don't ever seem to know what it is. They're just convinced that the conventional understanding is wrong. I, I get so tired of talking to flat earthers about this. I ask the question, what caused the lunar eclipse? And then what caused the solar eclipse? How far away is the sun? All these kind of questions. And the answers I get is, I don't know, I don't know, but I know what it isn't. They, they define the world in a very weird way. They define the world in times, terms of what they don't believe or don't know, in terms of what they do believe or do know. It's a most strange way of looking at the world. They claim the moon is a transparent disk. You can see stars shining through it. Again, that is not true. I've watched a number of lunar occultations where the moon passes in front of a star, and when it does, a star disappears. You can't see it shining through. And they make that claim anyway. Again, that's another false claim that they make. I have a photograph here. It didn't do such a great job on this. I didn't have my best equipment with me, but this is the star Arcturus. I've got an arrow pointing to it. Hopefully you can see it on the video there. And there's the moon. It's the first quarter phase. And after about another 20 minutes, the moon moved forward. There's the rest of the moon, by the way, because it's half lit and half dark. And a little bit later on, it moved forward and uh, it covered up Arcturus. Arcturus is not visible, uh, uh, visible there. Excuse me, not Arcturus, Aldebaran. Aldebaran, I misspoke. Okay, solar eclipse. Here's a photograph that I think Jim Bonser took this one as well. And this one is a beautiful uh, solar eclipse. And they want to argue that uh, there's something else going on here. Well, I'm going to wrap it up here soon. Uh, you know, if the Earth is flat then nothing can orbit the earth. So there are no satellites, and the moon doesn't orbit either. It just goes in big circles. There's, you can't break through the glass dome, so uh, there's nothing there. And there are no satellites. There are no astronauts, and we haven't been to the moon, all right? Except mm, I know of at least two Christians who walked on the moon. Actually, they, won, they came to Christ later, but Charlie Duke and Jim Irwin. Jim Irwin is now deceased. But I, I contacted Charlie Duke a few years ago, and I asked him, look, would you give me a quote on this? He said, sure, be happy to. He said, I was a lunar module pilot of the Apollo 16 mission to the moon. We launched from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida on April 16, 1972. We left Earth orbit uh, uh, for our three-day trip to the moon about three hours later. As we maneuvered our spacecraft to dock with our lunar module, the Earth came into view about 20,000 miles away. It was an awesome sight. 
And as you can see in the photo, it, the Earth, is obviously a sphere and not a flat circle. As we journal, journey to the moon, we could look out our windows and see a smaller Earth, and each time we would see different land masses, so it was obviously rotating on its axis. Charlie Duke, Christian astronaut. Or consider Jeffrey Williams. Uh, he's more recent. He spent a lot of time in the space shuttle, took a lot of photographs of the Earth from the space shuttle, and uh, space station, excuse me, and he, uh, he uh, had a book called The Work of His Hands. I have a copy of that book. It's marvelous photography it has, and he has many pictures of the Earth, some of them showing clearly that the Earth is a globe. No tricks here, no fisheye lens. This is actually a picture. All right, what is the motivation of the flat earthers? I think some are well, undoubtedly well-intentioned. They mean well, they really believe this, they're convinced of this, but they're just wrong. I think some are doing this as a prank. And they're literally having quite a bit of fun, quite a bit of amusement at the people who are taking this all too seriously when it really is just a prank. I'm also convinced that some out there are just doing this for malice. They're attempting to make Christians uh, look, look foolish and to discredit Scripture. And the people who want to argue the earth is flat from a biblical standpoint are doing their bidding for them. And that is hurtful, and it really hurts me to see people do that. Well, if you want to learn more about this, I have written a book. It's called Falling Flat, a Refutation of Flat Earth Claims. We have it available from Answers in Genesis. We also have a DVD called Faith on the Edge. We didn't produce this, but uh, I'm in this and a few other people done by the Creation Guys, and we carry this product as well. We also I want to mention something else we have going on, the Creation Apologetics course you can take. There are really a sel six self-paced courses. Enroll now for only 19 bucks at theanswerseducation.com. And also, by virtue of uh, watching today, you can, uh, you can uh, get some uh, free shipping and a discount if you order $49 or more from our website. The way to get advantage of that is to use the code SAVE10, that is S-A-V-E-10, and this expires on April 30th. So you've got about 10 days to do that. And they've got answersingenesis.org store down there. You can check it out. And now, uh, we're also having any orders more than $50, $50 or more, we offer free shipping. We're doing that now through the duration of the closures we have here at the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. We're not open, but uh, we hope to open soon. But until then, and when that happens, you can order, still order things, but even though our bookstores aren't open, and you can, uh, you can order those things with free shipping for $50 or more until we open again. I mentioned the uh, hard hits we're taking. We are uh, looking for uh, donations. We are in need, as so many other people are in need as well, but we do have bills to pay, even though our revenue stream has reduced tremendously. So you can go to answersingenesis.org, uh, donate. And finally, I want to uh, close off with the live programs. We'll be doing, uh, right now the schedule is 10 a.m., 12 noon, 3 p.m., and 7 p.m. And uh, of course, you're enjoying one of these right now, or maybe not enjoying it, but you're here nevertheless. I appreciate you coming today, uh, and, and I just want to thank you all for being here.